Normally this lesson is a great day to like bring in some snacks and like actually eat the Oreos that we're studying. Um, but I'm just going to insert this meme here. And we're going to pretend that we actually looked at Oreos and weighed them in class. So we want to estimate the average weight of an Oreo cookie and determine if the average weight is less than what's advertised by the company. So we've got a random sample of 30 cookies and we're going to find the weight of each cookie in grams. Um, a hypothetical, let's say that we live in a world where we can like all bring in food to class and share it. Um, let's say our mean weight that we got was X bar of 11.1921 grams and standard deviation SX, so this is the standard deviation just from our sample, is 0 0.0817 grams. And we want to estimate the true weight of all Oreos with 95% confidence. What I'd like you to do is answer questions 1 through 6 on your own. It's pretty um, guided for you. And then we'll go over the second part of the notes together. So pause the video, do 1 through 6 now. Okay, so our point estimate here um, for the true mean that we're using is 11.1921. So that was our X bar. It's the point estimate. It's the one number we're using just to guess what the true mean is. And then for the population, parameter, sample, and statistic, this is all a review. Our population would be all Oreos, and our sample would be just the 30 that we randomly selected. The parameter is mu, the true mean weight of Oreos, and our statistic is x bar, the mean weight of the sample. Remember the two words that start with p go together, so population and parameter, and then the two s's go together, sample and statistic. Okay, was the sample a random sample? I believe it does say that it's a random sample. Um, why is this important? Well, it's important because randomness allows us to generalize our results to the entire population. If we just picked 30 cookies, like the first 30 cookies we saw, um, it's possible that we, maybe we picked a package where, you know, on that day the machinery at the factory was like churning out cookies that were a little heavier or a little lighter than your normal. Um, so the randomness is really important. Now here's where if we were actually doing this, it wouldn't really be random because I would probably just buy one package of Oreos from one store. Even two packages of Oreos from two different stores. Like, it's not really random, but the problem says it's a random sample, so we're going to assume that it's random. Okay, what's the formula for calculating the standard deviation? Well, you can look at your formula sheet if you want. We're dealing with one population, um, and we're looking at a mean. The formula for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar is the standard deviation of the population over root n. So that's what I've written here. Um, think back to the unit on sampling distributions. The 10% rule must be met in order to use this formula. Now, we run into a problem here because we don't know the standard deviation of the population. If we did, if we knew the standard deviation of the population, don't you think we'd know the mean of the population? Like, how would we know the standard deviation of the weights of all Oreo cookies without knowing the mean of all Oreo cookies? Like, that doesn't really make sense. And if we knew the mean of all Oreo cookies, why would we be doing a confidence interval right now? We would know the mean. There'd be no reason to estimate the mean because we'd know it. So what we're going to do in this formula is we're going to use SX instead of sigma. So what we're doing is just kind of substituting in the standard deviation from the sample instead of the standard deviation from the population. When we do this, it's called a standard error. Just to sort of remind any reader that this isn't the true standard deviation of our sampling distribution. It's an estimation. This is on the formula sheet as well. So we're looking at random variable, one population, x bar. All the way on the right, it says standard error of sample statistic. We're using s over root n, so the standard deviation from the sample over root n gives us the standard error of x bar. Okay, so now I've plugged in some numbers here. Our standard error is 0 0.0149 grams, technically. I didn't write grams. My bad. Now we're allowed to do this because the 10% rule is definitely met. There's for sure more than 300 Oreos. There's probably 300 Oreos at the grocery store, like period. So there's for sure more than 300 Oreos in the entire population of all Oreos. Okay, would it be appropriate to use a normal distribution to model the sampling distribution? When we learned about sampling distributions, we learned that if n was greater than or equal to 30, we could use the CLT to say that the sampling distribution was approximately normal. 
and we just meet that condition here. N is exactly 30, so by the CLT, the sampling distribution would be approximately normal. Okay, so now we get to the parts that you haven't tried yet. When finding the margin of error for a confidence interval um, for a proportion, we use Z star. For a mean, we're going to have to use something else. We're going to be using something called T star as a critical value. Let me show you why we have to do that. So if you think about a Z distribution um, that's normal, uh, we have a single peak and there's a very small area in the tails. So I've drawn the Z distribution in pink. Sorry. That is orange. I've drawn the Z distribution in orange here. What I've drawn in pink is the T distribution. The T distribution doesn't have um, as much right at the center, so it's not as high at the center, and it has more area in the tails. So you can see that it's a little bit more spread out. There's more area out here. We have to use a T distribution when we deal with means because we need more area in the tails to account for that increased variability that comes from using the standard deviation from the sample instead of the true standard deviation of the population. When we use the standard error instead of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, we're introducing some variability and some error. And in order to account for that, we need a little bit more area in our tails of our distribution. So now we're going to look at T distributions compared to Z distributions. And as always, there's an app for this. Um, so I'll put a link to this app in the video description. But what I've done so far is I've set this up for means. Um, we'll say the population is normal. I'm going to set the mean, like the true mean weight of Oreos to 11.3. It doesn't really matter for this demo, but let's just say. And let's just say the true standard deviation is 1. Um, I made the sample size a little bit smaller. We're going to go with n equals 10 for now. And then I sampled 100 times. For each sample, um, this applet has calculated the 95% confidence interval. And you can see that a couple times it did not capture the true mean. But most of the time it did. In fact, 96% of the time it captured the true mean. That's pretty good. And we would expect it to capture the true mean about 95% of the time. Now this is using a Z distribution with sigma. You can see that over here. This is kind of unrealistic because as I just said, in the real world, if you knew sigma, you would not need to do a confidence interval because like you would probably know the true mean. So let's see um, if we do a Z distribution with S. Mm, definitely not as good. When we do a Z distribution but we just use S instead of sigma, we uh, capture the true mean 93% of the time. So there are more times here where we're missing. Now these are the same samples as before and you can see when I switch the dots, all these point estimates, don't change. What's changing is the width of the interval. So changing from using sigma to using s, our intervals are getting more narrow, and that means we're missing the true mean more often. To account for that, we'll use a t distribution. So here's what happens when we use t. Now it's still not perfect, so it's not as great as say the z distribution with sigma, which was 96% of the intervals captured the true mean. But it is better than the z distribution with s. That was only 93% of the time. So the t distribution, it's a little bit wider, as I have in the drawing here. And that's to account for the fact that when you use s instead of sigma, your intervals are going to be a little more narrow. So we need to make the t distribution a little bit wider to account for that. So to summarize, if we use a Z distribution or Z star with sigma, it's very good. The confidence interval, super good. However, it's not a very realistic scenario because when are you going to know the true standard deviation of the population? If we use the Z distribution or Z star and we put an S instead of sigma, this is very realistic. It's very realistic that we'd know S but not sigma. However, it wasn't a very good estimate. Our confidence intervals weren't as accurate. The t-distribution, on the other hand, is both realistic and it's good. It wasn't as good as z-star with sigma, but that could have just been that particular run of the applet, to be honest. Let's uh, reset this and try it again and see what happens. Okay, so this time z with sigma, 91% of the samples captured the true mean. t is 92%. And I'm just curious, what's z with um, s? Ooh, 88%. That's not good. 
So in this um, new run of the applet, it looks like T and Z with sigma are pretty comparable. T actually did a little bit better. Um, I think we can all agree that they're both better than using the Z distribution with S. Like that's clearly not working for us here. Now one thing to note, when you increase the degree of freedom, the T distribution will look more and more normal. So the T distribution is interesting. It actually changes shape depending on your sample size. And that's why I changed this n to be 10, because it's not as obvious. If I make n 30, our z distributions and our t distributions look pretty similar. So the larger your sample size gets, the more normal the t distribution looks. Okay, let's continue with this Oreo example now that we've explored why we need a t distribution. For the Oreo example, I believe we're doing 95% confidence, so we need to find a t star. So we're going to do this in the table, and then I'll show you how to find it on your calculator. So we need to know the degree of freedom first. Degree of freedom is just n minus 1, so in this case that'd be 29. Then you have to think about the area in the tail. 95% confidence puts 95% of the data in the middle of the distribution, which leaves 0.025, or 2.5%, in each tail. So on your formula sheet, if you look at table B, table B is the t distribution. Now you can see along the left-hand side, it shows you degree of freedom. Along the top, it's showing you the tail probability. So we want 0.025 for the tail probability. The question is, do they have our degree of freedom? They do, 29. Okay, so our T star is 2.045. Now just a heads up, if your degree of freedom is not listed here, like you can see, it gets less and less specific. Um, always round down with your degree of freedom. Okay, so 2.045 from the table. Now if you want to use your calculator, it's very similar to what we've done in previous units. So when you go to second distribution, inverse t is right here. It's going to ask you for the area and the degree of freedom. And as usual, when you're using calculator speak, make sure you label what you're typing in. Area, 0.025, degree of freedom, 29. And we get the exact same number from the calculator. Okay, time for the margin of error. Margin of error is everything after the plus or minus in your confidence interval. The format of this is exactly the same as we are using for proportions. We start with our critical value, in this case that's t star, and then we have our standard deviation normally, but we're going to do standard error here because we don't know sigma. We already calculated that, but I wrote it out again. 2.045 for t star, and then standard error. Oh, my computer is overheating. Uh-oh. I dumped a bunch of stuff onto my hard drive, and my computer lost like 30 pounds, and then I recorded the end of the video, and then it didn't save. So, take two, I guess. Let's calculate the 95% confidence interval. So, is our point estimate plus or minus our margin of error? This is just like we were doing with proportions. Here our point estimate was x bar 11.1921 plus or minus the margin of error we got in number 9, and there's our interval. Number 11 says to interpret. See if you can do that on your own, um, and then also try to answer number 12. Pause the video and try those two right now. So interpreting is very similar um, to proportions. We are 95% confident that the true mean weight of Oreos is between 11.1616 grams and 11.2226 grams. Make sure you've included context so that you're mentioning weight of Oreos and then say grams after the numbers. Now before we answer number 12, what we just did was calculate and interpret a confidence interval using the four-step process. We didn't label it as the four-step process, but let me just show you what those four steps were. Um, it actually did state for us in the problem, we want to estimate the true mean weight with 95% confidence. There's the state step. For plan, there were three conditions that we checked, we just didn't write out plan. The first condition we checked was that the uh, sample was randomly collected. Second condition is the 10% um, rule or independence. So we assumed there were more than 300 Oreos. And then the third condition is that the um, sampling distribution has to be approximately normal. They don't have to go in that order, but those are the three conditions. Random, independent, slash 10% rule, and then normal. On the next page, we did the do step. It was just split up into many different parts. And then finally, we concluded. So you just did a four-step process question, even though we didn't write the four steps. Okay, so let's answer number 12. 
According to Nabisco, um, an Oreo weighs 11.3 grams. Does our confidence interval provide convincing evidence that the true average is less than 11.3? And yes, our interval does provide good evidence that the true mean weight is less than their claim because their claim is safely above our interval. All right, so the last thing I wanna note is just something about the conditions. The normal condition is just a little bit different than proportions. So for our normal condition, if n is less than 30, you can just check to see if there's any strong skewness or skew. If there's no strong skew, then you can use the t-distribution. The t-distribution is pretty tough. So if there's a minor outlier or the sample doesn't look normal, it's probably okay. As long as there's no strong skewness, you should be fine to use the t-distribution. Skewness? Skew? As long as there's no strong skew. I don't know why I'm saying skewness in these notes. Um, if this is for a test or the AP test, you would want to show a graph to prove that the sample's not skewed. So do it on your calculator and then sketch it or just do it by hand. Somehow show that the graph is not skewed, the sample is not skewed. Um, if n is greater than or equal to 30, then you're good. The sampling distribution will be approximately normal no matter what. But if it's less than 30, just check for skew. And then last thing I want to mention in this video is just a summary because we've done a lot of stuff with confidence intervals in a very short amount of time. So just as a summary, for proportions, um, use a z distribution. p hat plus or minus z star and then our standard error um, using p hat. For means, if you happen to know sigma, you can use a z distribution, but this is very rare. In fact, in my textbook, it is barely mentioned. <laughs> um, but if you don't know sigma, you can just use a t-distribution. This is much more common. And with the t-distribution, we use s instead of sigma. So we're doing the standard error. Once again, we're kind of estimating the true standard deviation. All of these are on your formula sheet, just in slightly different places. I would say it's best to not memorize. Like for proportions, use z. For means, use t. Don't memorize. You can just think through it logically. Like when you get to means and you don't know sigma, just remember what we talked about in this video. Like, oh yeah, we need to use the t-distribution to account for that variability that we've introduced. So yeah, what I'm saying is use your brain. You have a brain, you can use it. It'll work, I promise. <laughs>